Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Australian shareholders, non-shareholders, and generally interested parties. Quick introduction: I founded Cerulean back in 1999 uh, as an MBO from what was then Logica, which was a fairly large UK software house, and uh, in its peak employed about 8,000 people and was briefly in the FTSE 100. So we we MBO the so the, the telecoms products division out of Logica and um, then went on to raise productivity funding and built a business over about uh, 15 years up to IPO in 2016. Oliver Gilchrist, um, Oliver, do a quick, quick introduction? A uh, very quick introduction. Uh, I uh, joined Cerulean uh, 19 years ago this Friday, um, so about two years after Louis set the company up uh, as CFO uh, then, uh, been with Louis ever since, uh, so almost from the beginning but not quite. Prior to that, PwC, uh, standard normal training through to the mid-90s and a couple of other IT companies between then and joining Cerulean. Back to you, Louis. So what do we do? Cerulean is a, a provider of enterprise software solutions to telecoms companies and when we say enterprise software we mean most of the software that telcos need to do their business except for the, the, the core functions such as payroll, HR and so on and to give you a bit of a, a bit more flavor of this this schematic shows the the different software modules that Cerulean provides to the market and they address everything from onboarding customers through call center channels for the CRM package, through self-service where customers provide their own services to themselves online, uh, men services, uh, monitor balances and so on, and also through mobile apps, through to the what we call service orchestration to connect those services to the network, through our service manager, management of all the products that we can sell to those customers or that our customers can sell to their own customers, uh, through quite a complex product catalog, um, and then on, on the uh, on the right hand side of this diagram, we have our convergent charging platform that monitors network usage, manages balances, decides whether customers' calls can be connected uh, in real time, and all of the, those sorts of things. Uh, and then we have our revenue management product, which puts that usage onto bills, uh, raises bills for that usage, and uh, manages accounts receivable, uh, payments collections, and so on. Uh, so without going into a lot of detail, this is a very, very broad set of software products. This is not a nice to have solution. This is a solution that telcos have to have to be in business. And um, they, we, we have today have a customer base of about 90 customers in, in around 45 countries. We'll talk more about the numbers uh, a little later. So just to draw your attention to the fact that the, the, the bulk of our business, the majority of our revenue comes from our, uh, our modular enterprise product suite, this large set of circles on the left hand side of the diagram and we we provide that um, in traditional what we would call on-premise mode so where customers have hardware installed on their premises we install our software on on the hardware uh, and so on the telcos are, are one of the last movers towards the full cloud implementation stacks i think because they, they're traditionally quite conservative businesses there's a lot of regulation around where their data can be held and they also believe themselves to be experts in, in doing that stuff themselves. However, we're seeing uh, more recently uh, a, 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 a real drift towards even telcos now uh, accepting cloud solutions. So we also offer our platform um, in, a, in a hosted um, environment on the cloud or the private cloud and a fully managed service that so we're providing an end-to-end -end SaaS offering for the enterprise platform as well, if that's what the customer requires. On the right hand side, the smaller circles are our generic billing products, which takes a, a small part of our overall functionality from that block diagram we just looked at and provides just the billing part, the billing and charging mainly to a very broad range of industries. And as you can see, that's everything from you know, security to publishing, digital media, leisure, real estate, and so on. And 
that, that's only offered as a cloud service, so we don't provide that as an on-premise solution. Um, and that, that, that enables us to get across into some other industry verticals uh, and uh, try and establish bridgeheads in those different markets that we might later follow through on with our enterprise product set. Highlights. So we, we've just reported our year-end numbers to the end of September 20. So these are our, our, our 2020 numbers. And we, we were really pleased that we managed to achieve uh, record highs in, in all the key KPIs that we, that we monitor, but particularly back order, which was up by 41%, 31 million. And put in the context of a Harris Broker forecast of 22.6 million for 21, uh, we're very encouraged that in these obviously quite difficult times, the, the leverage of our back order to our Harris Broker forecast is obviously quite high especially set against previous year's number of 22 million of backlog against a house forecast of 20.8 million. And that was driven by quite a big increase in sales to existing customers. So most of our revenue comes to existing customers over 80%. And we had a, a lot of sales in, in 20 to existing customers, but also a, a couple of um, big new customers were brought on board enterprise customers. Um, uh, one of which was in South Africa that we signed at the beginning of the year, last October. Uh, the other of which was our largest ever contract that we signed in September, right at the very end of the financial year. And that deal really continued for the trend of us winning larger contracts with larger customers. And that, that's, that's particularly important because, not just because larger, larger customers, bigger contracts are, are bigger upfront revenues, but they tend to be customers who want to take our full managed service, so the contract that we won in September was in fact a SaaS deal, or software as a service contract, to provide a fully hosted solution in the cloud and to manage that solution on behalf of the customer, such that the customer simply accesses the software online. And obviously the ongoing recurring revenues that arise from that are much greater than a more traditional smaller deal with a smaller customer. Also, larger customers, larger contracts, uh, typically come with larger license sales, and those typically mean higher sport and maintenance, ongoing sport and maintenance fees. Moving on to coronavirus, we're very fortunate in that there are two, there are two aspects to, to the coronavirus situation. The first is the, the, the impact on our market. And we were very fortunate to be in a market which has probably benefited from the coronavirus pandemic in that it really has brought to the fore the importance of telco and enabling us all to communicate and continue our lives whilst being distanced. And I think that that has given telcos a spring in their step. So I think they're more confident about continuing with investments, particularly when we already had the, this big wave of 5G investment rolling through the telco world and leading to investment, not just in 5G network, but in trickle down to ancillary systems, such as the ones that we provide. So, so that, that I think has been a net benefit. And then in terms of, of the operational challenges, I, I think we're also very fortunate that as a tech business, we were already used to online collaboration and holding meetings in Teams and Zoom and so on, and working with customer teams in different parts of the world and our own teams in different parts of the world in that kind of way. So the move to remote working online for us was not nearly as, as painful as we probably thought it was going to be. So I think that's a positive. And also our customers are used to this way of working too. So that's enabled us to carry on delivering systems to customers completely remotely. So on the right-hand side of this slide, our new customer in South Africa, contract signed in October, we went live with that customer with a quite a complicated real-time system in July, completely remotely. And normally there might have been five or six people on site to make that happen. Earlier in the week on, on Monday, we went live with a big system in Belgium. Uh, we put systems live in Germany and in Denmark during this crisis over the last few months. And also, uh, finally, from a sales point of view, the sales process that we're in have continued. And obviously, the, the, the larger we announced in September is proof that one of those, um, you know, did lead to a particularly substantial contract, but lots of other processes have also gone on and been resolved and we won plenty of other business. We've also added to the pipeline, in fact, increasing the pipeline size by about 20% in 2020. So that, that, again, in the middle of the coronavirus crisis, demonstrates that there's still opportunity out there and we're not seeing that dry up. So in summary, I think the outlook for 21 is very positive. We have the highest visibility I think we've ever had at the start of any financial year of our achieving our, our house broker forecast. And also we're encouraged by the fact that the pipeline for new opportunities does remain strong.
So just a quick look at some of these key KPIs on the next page. One thing I'm particularly pleased about is our recurring revenue run rate. This is the top line middle chart shows a big jump. There was a, there was a big increase in our, in our um, annualized recurring revenue run rates as that year end. So this grew by 57% year on year and is obviously growing at a much faster rate than our top left-hand corner, top line revenue chart. And obviously that's really important in terms of visibility going forward and also faster growth. And that was partly driven by the managed service revenue increase and the increase in that run rate is shown on the top right-hand side of this page. And whilst that's from a low base, it's a very substantial jump and it indicates the extent to which our larger, newer customers are more and more willing to take the, the managed service software as a service option. Finally, on this page, I'll, I'll just pull out the new orders figures, which is the left-hand column middle chart. So we achieved record high again, at least we matched last year's record increase in new orders, which was essentially ahead of previous years. And, and that is what's enabled us to increase this back order uh, to such a great extent. Okay, I'll now hand over to Oliver to, to talk about the, the number in a bit more detail. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we've got four, uh, four slides to cover the financials. There's this first one on page eight, which is uh, pulling out some of the key highlights, followed by a standard profit and loss account uh, or income statement, uh, balance sheet, and uh, then a cash flow statement. Uh, Having a look specifically on this first page, just to reiterate some of the key numbers Louis pulled out, uh, new orders. We were very encouraged by the new orders in that it was uh, last year, 19, it was a record high at 23.3 million. And we repeated that this year, which we found very encouraging. So it was a sort of second year of high water marker, which we're going to progress on from next year. Back order book, just to a little bit more meat on the bone. What we mean by back order book is uh, contracted for, but not yet recognized revenue, along with the equivalent of one year's annualized uh, support and maintenance looking forward. Uh, so the broker's forecast for revenue for next year, I believe is at about 22.6 million. We have effectively in our fuel tank for future revenue to burn, uh, including one year's support, 31 million pounds. And as Louis said earlier, we've we've never been in a better position for visibility of uh, being able to see underpinning what is now the current year's financial numbers. Coming back to the historicals, total revenue at 20.8 uh, million, up on 18.8 the year before. Below that, there's a breakdown between the three key constituent items, software, services, and other. Other is sort of rebuildable expenses, but more, more importantly, third-party hardware and license, where the end customer wants one throat to choke, so they contract with us for everything. Between services and software, the direction of travel over the last few years has been towards software with increased licenses, increases in support and maintenance, etc. However, in 2020, as you can see, there was a, a movement back just in this one year towards services. And quite a lot of this was to do with timing, because in the previous year, financial year 19, maybe some people picked this up if you'd attended a previous presentation by us, uh, we actually won four large new deals. So there's quite a lot of implementation work going on in financial year 2020. Going forwards, we expect to move the balance between the three more towards uh, the sort of the weighting we had in, in 19 with an increase as a percentage of total in licenses and in support and maintenance. Recurring revenue in the year, 6 million, which we're very encouraged coming up from 5.1 million. More important, as Lou was alluding to on the previous slide, the run rate at year end, like the visibility of what we believe is going to occur in the next 12 months based on the, the run rate at September uh, 20 had increased again to 7.9 million. Adjusted EBITDA at 5.8 million that was healthily up, slightly helped by um, IFRS 16 accounting. I'll come back to that on the balance sheet in a minute. And the adjusted EBITDA margin at near to 28%, again, uh, up on previous years. As Louis again said earlier, all our key KPIs are uh, pointing in the right direction. Net cash, just a little bit of history for those who haven't heard the story before. We IPO'd in 2016. It was a partial raising of equity and we took a £5 million loan out with our bankers, HSBC, who we've banked with since incorporation in 1999. They lent us £5 million. I think March 21, we finished paying back that loan. So we talk about net cash 
with I think gross at about 8.3 and 600,000 pounds of borrowings left to go. So effectively we are a company without debt and cash year on year is increasing after we pay out a dividend, which is the line above. We increase that year on year by 12% to 5.5p. Detailed P&L account next, not many additional numbers to pull out here. I have historically over the last few years budgeted at the gross margin being at around 70% looking for the direction of travel towards 75% as we get more licensing coming in, more recurring revenue, et cetera. Very encouraged actually in this year that we actually already have moved towards 74% despite a sort of waiting towards services. One of the things this actually demonstrates is, is that Cerulean services income isn't a sort of standard stack it high and, uh, and earn this. It's actually we're earning extremely good consultancy rates. And even in that sector, we're earning good margins. Operating expenses up, but as we looked at before, in terms of the adjusted EBITDA margin increasing, there's obviously also an operational gearing play here with top line increasing at better rates, You know, not having to increase the, uh, the, the overheads at quite the same rate. So, so looking for EBITDA improvements on that basis. Uh, finance costs you would have expected to be heading towards zero. But because of IFRS 16, where we've had to capitalize our property uh, leases, and there's a notional interest charge which comes in on this line. So the notional finance costs have actually gone up. The real underlying ones head towards zero as the loan is repaid. Tax charge or credit this year remains extremely low. We do pay a bit of tax in India. We utilize R&D tax credits in the UK. So once again, like in recent years, a very, very low tax charge. Uh, Not much to say on the balance sheet. You can see within the non-current assets, we've got a new right of use asset at 4.4 million pounds, fourth line down. That is that we've had to, under IFRS 16, capitalize our London and our subsidiary India office uh, property costs, just in line with accounting policies. We set up in India about 12, 13 years ago. They are a subsidiary owned by us. We built it from the ground up. That in itself has really helped us uh, both historically and looking forwards to maintain margins and be as efficient as possible with costs. We have a lot of product knowledge out there and we're actually delivering uh, end-to-end projects from our Indian teams now. Apart from that, we've already talked about the cash at the 8.3 million gross with borrowings of 600,000 in the current liabilities. And down in the net assets, uh, below the net asset note, the last line is treasury stock. We did um, enter the market to buy some uh, some equity at year end just to uh, fund an LTIP for some of the management who didn't partake in the IPO who qualify for some shares post year end on the back of the share performance. And those were exercised early in the new financial year. Not really much to talk on here. I mean, Cerulean really has a history over the last 20 years, because prior to IPO in 2016, we were under the auspices of uh, PE houses. So we have been used to paying a dividend, having the financial uh, structures and rigor to be cash generative, paying out a dividend in another form uh, with the capital reduction exercises, etc. cetera. Uh, and really, there's just more of the same. The key component here is a close proximity of P&L to cash generation, which allows us to continue to have this uh, accretive dividend policy. I don't have much more to add than that. So, Louis, back to you. Thanks, Oliver. Just a quick look at the geographical breakdown of our revenue. So, on, on those two pie charts on the left-hand side, in most years, about half our revenue comes from Europe and the rest is spread between Asia Pacific and the Americas. That's the blue and the green uh, parts of that pie chart. Uh, this year in 20, we had a bit more revenue coming from Europe. It's really just a timing thing. There's nothing particularly underlying that. And then a very small amount of revenue from Middle East and Africa. We, we, we think we will see some more revenue from that region as we hope to open up the Middle East market with our partner Nokia, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail shortly, but that's a fairly normal distribution of revenue for us geographically. But as you can see, it, 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 it's a global customer base. And if you look at the list of customers on the right hand side, we have some example logos. They really are all over the place. Some that you'll have heard of, um, three in the UK, for example, big mobile operator, uh, cable and wireless, uh, you probably will have come across, and some other household names. So we, we have a, a very broad range of customers in different kinds of telco verticals. So, for example, we do provide software to the really big tier ones that you'll have heard of, like three. But for those, we tend to do niche plays. So for three, we provide uh, billing for 5G. For cable and wireless, we, we, which is part of uh, Liberty Global, one of the world's largest telcos, 
we do billing for most of the Caribbean and, and Central American properties. And uh, for KDDI in Japan, for example, one of the biggest telcos in Japan, we provide uh, our network inventory modules, so just one of our product modules. Whereas for the mid-range players, we and, and MBNOs and so on, we tend to provide everything, our, most of our suite. And in fact, most of our customers have most of our suite. Also, we provide um, software to different kinds of telcos, as I was saying earlier. Um, so, for example, our new customer in the UK we signed in September, the, the largest ever contract is actually a, an energy company, uh, but one of the biggest power generators in in UK, or power providers, I should say, in the UK, that also has a telco business, which is a substantial business in its own right. And you know, we have, we have a similar customer in Denmark, for example, the second largest power generator in Denmark. It's also the second largest provider of TV services and broadband in Denmark. So we provide our software for their operations. We also provide our software to um, what we call MBNOs, mobile virtual network operators, and a whole manner of different kinds of telco businesses. Um, another good example, at the bottom right-hand corner of that logo wall, Link Mobility is uh, Europe's biggest aggregator of messaging. So um, if you think about people voting by text message on TV shows, Eurovision Song Contest, who wants to be a millionaire, well, whatever, all of those messages have to get aggregated and processed. And, and Link is the biggest in Europe at, at, at that. So, so that, that's another kind of telco. It's not what you might think of as a traditional telco that provides a market for our software as well. So a very broad range of, of, of market verticals we can sell into. Just moving on to look at the concentration of revenue. And I just wanted to uh, go through this because it, 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 at first glance, it looks like a concern. Goodness, 21% of your revenue with, with your top customer and 57% top five. But the, the reality here is that that's really a function of us doing large implementation projects. And what tends, what will happen is that a new customer, for example, one we just signed uh, in September, a uh, big new customer, large contract, and we, we will find the majority of that revenue, the, 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 the five-year term license revenue, because in line with IFRS 15, although we sign mostly term licenses, uh, we, we have to um, take the full amount of that, of the, of the typically, typically a five-year term in the year in which we deliver the software. Um, so that revenue will go to 21, and, and then all this, pretty much all the services revenue for the implementation project will go to 21, such that, you know, that that then becomes a very large customer in that particular financial year. But in 22, when that customer is then live and in support and maintenance, this one will still be a big one because we're providing a full, a full software service solution, but it won't be in the top five. And other customers would drop out of the top 10 even. So, so it just depends. But the point here is that those high concentrations are different customers in each year. So we're not concerned about that variety of, of customer in those slots. A quick look at the track of revenue and how it splits between existing customers and new customers over the last uh, seven years or so. So the point about this chart is to show that even in years where we don't derive much revenue from sales to new customers, like 16 and, and 20 just got, and I'll explain, come back to that in a moment, we still manage to maintain our, our steady growth position because we have quite a large customer base that we also sell into. And as, as I said previously, we, we derive a rate of our revenue from that base. So we're really not very dependent on winning new deals in any current year to achieve our numbers. And then just a very quick few words on why 20 has such a low amount of revenue from sales to new customers. Well, we, start, you know, we signed this big contract, so, so what happened there? And the, the simple answer is that it's just a timing thing. So the, the customer we signed in South Africa at the beginning of the year bought two of our modules. So the actual services involved to implement that customer were, were relatively small. And the license for that contract, because of the way that contract's structured, we can't take until 21. So the term license didn't fall into 20. The services are very small compared to a normal, normal project. I mean, typically we will do two, three, four million dollars of, of, of services on, on a new implementation. Also, the, the new customer we signed at the end of the year, because we signed that customer in the third week of September with the year closing on the 30th, none of that revenue went into this financial year. So through these sort of these quirks of timing, new customers we actually won in the current year contributed a very small amount of our overall revenue. Having said that, as I've heard before, we, we won four substantial new customer contracts in 19, 
And a lot of the existing customer revenue we were earning in 20 was from those contracts in the previous year. So there are some timing vagaries, but the, the overall trend is, is consistent growth. Quick look at competition. So we, we essentially have competitors that fall into three main groups. We have the, the, the people on the left, uh, the, the large ISVs or uh, independent software vendors, so big companies like Oracle, uh, Netcracker, which is part of NEC, and Amdocs, which is not a name many, some of you will have heard of, but, it, but it's the largest uh, player in, in pure billing, uh, turnover about $3 billion, I think. We tend to beat these guys because we have a very different approach. So we're very much a product uh, offering. Our strategy is that we don't provide bespoke solutions. We don't customize our solution. It is what it is. Um, and that makes it a lot, a lot more cost effective and time to market obviously is uh, much improved. Um, and it's just a very different strategy. So, so the, the, the big guys on the left are looking for very large service heavy engagements over many years. Um, where lots of bodies will get provided onto very large projects. We're looking to secure as much recurring revenue as possible, uh, preferably a SaaS type deal um, with a relatively small amount, although it's still a substantial amount of revenue up front, a relatively small amount compared to the bigger guys of services revenue. In the middle, you've got the network equipment vendors, and the, the parties that are really connected to us are Ericsson. And, and then the two Chinese players, ZT and Huawei. And I think as most of you will be aware, ZT and Huawei have uh, not found it easy to compete in a lot of our, our markets uh, over the last few years. And in fact, Huawei and ZT have largely retrenched out of the European market for software in, 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 the, in the markets that we're in. And, and obviously they're not present in, in, in North America. So whilst they're still uh, competitive in the developing markets, for the more lucrative deals, um, they're, they're a lot less present than they were. So that's helped us out enormously. And then with Nokia, Nokia are actually a, a partner. So they're our key channel partners. So Nokia don't have their own billing software. So they partner with Cerulean to provide that. So essentially, we, we are part of their bundle of products they sell to the market. So where Nokia sell network equipment and their own radio access network and charging and so on. The, the billing part of their supply is now being offered as Cerulean. And this is a relationship that has um, taken some time to get together. Nokia have had a number of reorganizations in the last two or three years that we've been trying to bring this to fruition. And finally, um, we, we, we are in a position where we do have um, a substantial amount of pipeline with Nokia. And some of the markets that they're strong in, like, for example, the Middle East I mentioned earlier, a market that's very hard for companies of our size, size to break into and, 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 and prosper in. So we're hoping that in those kind of markets, Nokia will be a, a, a way for us to operate and, and win some, some of that market share. But also Nokia, obviously looking at uh, quite substantial deals, and, and we, will, we expect to see more engagement with the tier one type customers through the Nokia channel because of their big brand and, and, their, and their global sales reach than we would expect to achieve on our own. And then finally, on the right-hand side of this page, we have smaller ISVs like ourselves. And these tend to be quite focused on um, fairly narrow parts of the market. So they're, they're, they're either regionally focused or focused on a particular type of telco. And, and, and there are just a lot less of these than there used to be. When we started out in, in this business, there were lots and lots of small ISVs like ourselves in this space. There's been a lot of consolidation, a lot of falling by the wayside. And uh, it, it, it is a narrow field in that respect. We're also finally uh, well covered by the independent analysts. Um, we, we're well known in the industry. Uh, Gartner particularly um, covers in their magic quadrant. Uh, we're well placed in their magic quadrant, which is a huge importance in, in the telco world. And a lot of telcos will, will simply go to Gartner for a list of, of vendors to send their request for proposal to. And it's very important to be, to be well positioned in Gartner. So we do spend a lot of time in marketing, um, ensuring that we are in the right place. So a quick look at, at sales pipelines. As I said earlier on, our top left-hand graph here, our total value of new customer pipeline, that's, the, that's the, the total value of all the opportunities in our pipeline, did grow by about 20% in 20, which, which we found very encouraging given 
the situation that the world finds itself in. And then the other chart to look at is the existing customer pipeline, the, the top right-hand graph, and that remains steady at um, around 35 million, so a small increase there. That, that's a very different sales cycle. So typically, new customer business, um, the, the sales cycles are anything from nine to 18 months, and they're very labor-intensive processes. Um, they involve answering huge RFP, sometimes as much as 10,000 individual questions have to be responded to, workshops, presentations, and so on. Whereas obviously existing customer business, uh, they're already customers, they typically want additional services or they're buying additional licenses or whatever. And they, they, you know, typically the, the, those are three month sales cycles. So sales cycle much more quickly through, through that pipeline and through the new customer pipeline. And then below the two charts below, we have some weightings. Just in, 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 this is not an exact science, but essentially that tells us that of the total value of the new pipeline, the new customer pipeline, for example, um, when we apply the probability assessment that's attached to each opportunity and gets updated on a pretty much weekly basis, uh, we would expect to win about 25 million of the 121 million at that point in time. So compared with a, a sales target of a bit less than 25 million, that, that, that gives us some confidence that we're in the right zone. Not an exact science, but it's important to get a sense as to where we think that, that we're likely to be. And then there's a bit more detail in the pipeline on this next slide. And I won't, I won't spend much time on this, but for, for those who are interested in understanding it in a bit more detail, this is simply breaking out the value of that pipeline at each stage. So at the bottom of the funnel on the left-hand side, new customer sales funnel, 9.8 million of potential sales at preferred supplier stage. Typically, that's where we've been selected and we're in final contract negotiations. So you know, we expect to win 80 or 90% of that of, of those deals. And when you go one up to shortlisted, it's we're typically in, in a one of three shortlist or one of two. So again, we expect to win typically one in two of those. So it gives some sense as to you know, more, more um, substance around those high-level estimates. So we, we're very encouraged by the back order book. And I think as all of us said, and I've, I've said, we, we, we just have this amazing visibility at this stage of the year, which is phenomenally um, positive in terms of having the confidence to go on and, and, and push the growth levers harder. We do have a good pipeline of new prospects increased uh, over, the, over the year, which is fantastic news given where the world's been at. And as I said at the beginning, we, we, we have managed to adapt to working remotely. And I think we are benefiting from trends driven by both the pandemic the shift to remote working and online and all of that stuff, which has given telco more importance, but also the, the huge rollout of 5G investment that was already underway at the start of all this. So uh, all in all, we're, uh, we, uh, we are very well positioned for 21. And we, we also felt that uh, as we have generated a, a reasonable amount of cash, that uh, we should pay dividends this year. And in fact, we've increased that dividend across the whole year by 12%. Great, thank you very much. That was a very interesting presentation and clearly um, 2020 has been an exceptionally good year for Cerulean. Um, and I don't know, one of the questions is sort of how much was uh, anticipated of the growth that has taken place this year or is it because of the pandemic situation that you have experienced perhaps better growth than was forecast? Yeah, I think... Uh it would be wrong to think that, I mean, we're not, we're not a, a drugs company developing vaccines. It would be wrong to think that we're, we, we've had a, a, a massive boost from coronavirus. I would say, you know, on balance, it's been positive because of the, of, of the confidence given to our case to continue the investment cycle they were in. Um, but it, it, the, 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 main, the main drivers, and bear in mind, these are long-term investment cycles, so... Uh, Telco has been investing in 5G for the last two or three years, and, and uh, some of these investors won't come to fruition for another two or three years. So I think that's the main driver, um, but it's certainly been helpful to an extent that Telco has become more prominent. Yeah. And then obviously, you know, you've, you've got, you've had quite a, a large growth. You have the capacity for that growth. It's been quite a sort of o o organic and you have capacity to take on. You've, you've just won a, a very large, significant client. Do you, you have capacity for that or do you have to change your structure or add to it in any way to accommodate for that type of growth? 
Yeah, we, 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 so, so we have to, because of the model and, and the fact that we, we do have to take on these large projects, we don't run at 100% utilization. So we do have some slack. And obviously, as if you think about, we were implementing, we're currently implement, just about finished implementing four or five big projects for new customers, one in 19, one, one at the beginning of the year. Um, we do have people coming through at the same time as, as, as new projects coming on. Um, but we all we, we we also are growing, and we asked we we have recruited during the pandemic, and we're aiming to grow in twenty one from about two hundred and thirty ish to two hundred and seventy ish. So we are looking to recruit mostly delivery people. So that most of that increases in people who would who would deliver services to to make these new customers live. Right. So most of the growth would be organic. There wouldn't be um, any sort of plans or targets for acquisition. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that, that that's very much part of our, our, our strategy, and that was one of the key reasons for going to to, the, to aim in the first place was to, to be able to have the currency to go and do those kind of uh, do do deals. And um, the, the the challenge has been getting across companies. So there are opportunities out there, um, but but what we found is to get to the next stage of okay, so this is interesting, but uh, how do we find out? more about this in more detail and get more confident and that is hard in, in, in a, one of the things that is more difficult in an online environment especially if, if companies have diverse um, office spaces and so on and just on the r d and, and obviously there's tax tax credits for the r d but how much um are, are you doing in r d and is there any sort of ip that's created and protected we own all our IPR, so we own the whole product, the whole product suite we, we own ourselves. It has been developed in-house. Um, because we now have uh, India as well as, as, as onshore, and we've got, I think, heading towards 140, 150 staff in India now, um, we undertake cost-wise 1.4 million pounds a year uh, in uh, unpaid for by clients uh, r d um, there's obviously paid for by clients or customers because uh, there's improvements to their products as well which uh, gets um migrated back into the what we call the product kernel the the main main the main product um we capitalize just a little bit more um on the financial side, we capitalize about a million pounds worth of that, not all of it, um, and we amortize the same amount. There's an additional amortization charge on top of that without getting into too many complications that arose on the IPO with some intrinsic um, accounting entries uh, for the PLC, which was set up buying the trading company. But the important aspect is we're amortizing approximately the same as what we're depreciating. And that 1.4 million gives us sort of 10 or 11,000 man days a year of, of uh, additional R&D year on year to develop. And the second most important, well, the most important is we do own that IPR. Um, it's ours. It's our product. Right. Great, thank you. And just if, um, Oliver, perhaps you can explain a little bit about the LTIPs. You mentioned some funding for LTIPs uh, during 2020, yep. if you can explain that in a bit more detail. Yeah, there's a, there's a management team effectively sitting uh, sort of, uh, well, myself and Louis are also on the management team, but, you know, sort of sitting in, in one sense just below us, um, uh, but, you know, or alongside us who didn't partake in the original IPO. Um, uh, and therefore, subsequent to the IPO, an LTIP was set up uh, for five of them um, and based on share performance over the last three years um, they they could exercise up to I think in totality about one percent of the share capital of the company um, and given the share price and the cash we had in the bank we felt it was better that we went into the marketplace to buy those shares as opposed to diluting by issuing some additional ones um, and therefore they for good reason, given the share price has gone from 76p on flotation to somewhere in the three pounds, haven't checked it this, today, um, uh, you know, and uh, and they're part of that team driving that. It was important to incentivize them. And at year end, there was just a timing issue whereby those shares which we went and bought were still sitting in treasury stock and uh, shortly after year end, they were actually exercised by them. Right, thank you. Um, a question here, um, what is the vision for Cerulean in five to 10 years time? Will you become a cloud-focused SaaS business? Yeah, I think very much so. I, I think different different things. So, so obviously, we want to grow. We want to be um, bigger, much bigger than we are. Uh, so it's important that we do that both organically through uh, channel partnerships, through 
and Nokia partnership, uh, as well as our direct sales. Also, we, we have a, a developing partnership with one of the big three, top three Indian SIs. We think will 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 we'll help enormously in that regard. Um, <clears throat> but also um, in organic growth. So, so, so we are we, we you know we are out there to make acquisitions. And we're very conservative about about of that, and that we we're very aware that making the wrong choice, doing the wrong deal, can, can, you know, can be very destructive. So we're, we're determined to do the right deals. We're to be looking for complementary product companies, not overlapping product companies. Uh, I've seen that as a, a place where tech companies generally fail in acquisitions. So we're very focused on not doing overlapping technology acquisitions. Um, but in, in, in terms of the, 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 the whole cloud thing, I mean, that, 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 the cloud software as a service, um, in, at the end of the day, whatever we call it, there's a growing trend for customers to want to use software in a SaaS way. That means that there's no, there's, there's, there's a much smaller upfront CapEx commitment. Um, they don't have to worry about having hardware on their sites and all the issues with security and, and, uh, and risk that involves and increasingly want to have everything as a service. And I think that that, that, that is very much where we would expect to be in five years time, where we'd have pretty much no customers having software installed on their own premises anymore, and everything will, will be in the cloud. I think even Telco will, will get there in the next five years. Just a question coming back to the um, ownership and uh, what percentage of the company is owned by, um, by the management? Yeah, I, I own 30 point something, Oliver owns 1.2. Uh, there's a small amount owned by the, the, the LTIP group, um, but it's sort of sub 1%. And then you've got uh, Gresham, which was Living Bridge, uh, Can Accord, Might and BlackRock, and then a, a string of other institutions that hold smaller amounts. We are sadly coming to the end of, of our time. Um, thank you very much for the very interesting and informative uh, presentation. Wishing you continued success and, and that uh, your great 2020 carries over into 2021. So um, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you for your time. Thank you.